So hello everyone and welcome to eCampus Ontario's webinar on adaptive learning using interactive simulations. My name is Don Eldridge and I'm a digital learning associate on the programs and services team at eCampus Ontario, where I work primarily on the adaptive learning portfolio. It gives me great pleasure to be moderating today's webinar and to introduce our main presenters. Uh, joining us today is Teresa Merwin, who is the Director of Simulation, Business Development and Interprofessional Learning at Mohawk College. She has worked at Mohawk College since 2008. In her role, she collaborates with community and academic partners in the pursuit of strategic opportunities and sustainable operations for priority areas, including digital health, healthcare and community services, simulations, skills training, and interprofessional learning. Also joining us from Mohawk College are Rachel Borsma, who is an occupational therapist by background who occasionally teaches in Mohawk College's OTA PTA program and is an adjunct clinical professor at McMaster University. She currently works at Mohawk College as a digital learning technician, where she consults with faculty and staff to create engaging and accessible online learning assets, such as virtual simulations that are easy to use for students, as well as faculty and staff. And Timothy Chan. Timothy has a background in occupational therapy and currently works as a digital learning technician at Mohawk College. In this position, he works collaboratively with faculty and staff to create a variety of different engaging and accessible online learning assets using a variety of platforms that best fit the use and needs of students, faculty, and staff. Some of these platforms include, but are not limited to, H5P, ThingLink, Affinity Learning, and press books. Timothy is also an adjunct clinical professor at McMaster University and occasionally teaches the therapeutic relationships course in the Canadian healthcare program at Mohawk College. Representing today's featured technology is Sean Doyle, who is a software developer and designer with a passion for building products that empower users. Sean is the co-founder of Affinity Learning, leading company direction, product development and customer success. Affinity empowers educators to simulate real world experiences through engaging interactive learning experiences founded in 2019 affinity has been utilized by educators across Canada within healthcare and human services disciplines like nursing paramedicine PSW laboratory sciences public safety social work and more. Affinity's intuitive authoring toolkit allows educators to quickly create interactive simulations using their existing educational content. Welcome, Teresa, Rachel, Timothy, and Sean. I'd also like to take this opportunity to honor and acknowledge that the offices of eCampus Ontario are located on the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, uh, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I recognize and am grateful for the legacy of all past, present, and future generations of the First Peoples of this land. I'm joining you today from Fort Francis, Ontario, which is situated in the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Métis people, where it is my great privilege to live, work, and learn. In this virtual space, we are all convening from different places. This is one of the things that makes the online environment special. I invite you to share your own land acknowledgement in the chat. To provide a bit of context, uh, adaptive learning platforms are educational technologies that assess a learner's knowledge and identify skills gaps and provide a personalized instructional path towards learning outcomes. Overlapping with adaptive learning are other technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning and intelligent tutoring systems. Often experiential in nature, these technologies are grounded in competency based instruction and move the learner towards mastery through ongoing practice and immediate feedback. Among the many benefits of adaptive learning, these technologies have been shown to improve learning efficiency, knowledge transfer and learner engagement. eCampus Ontario has been working in the adaptive learning space for the past several years, where we see these technologies as an important and emerging part of the digital transformation of higher education. You can see details about our work by visiting our adaptive learning webpage at the link now being posted in the chat. Uh, 
For the remainder of today's webinar, we will hear about a collaboration between Mohawk College and Affinity Learning. This collaboration, which benefited in part from the province of Ontario's historic $70 million investment in the virtual learning strategy, enabled educators to build virtual content and scenarios that demonstrated user-centered design, as well as continuous evaluation and improvement. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing and hand things over to our presenters to share some details about their work and the innovative technology behind it. So over to you. Thank you very much, Don. That was a lovely introduction uh, to ourselves and to our presentation today. Um, so welcome to today's webinar, and it will be presented by Mohawk College and Affinity Learning. Um, so Mohawk College uh, did receive funding last fiscal for the Virtual Learning Strategy Fund through eCampus Ontario in the area of digital delivery. Our project was to build virtual content and scenarios using the Affinity Learning platform. We did have um, upwards of about 20 members on our team um, from Mohawk College, as well as members from Sean Teams at Affinity as well. And today you'll hear from um, four of us, uh, three from Mohawk and from, from Sean at Affinity. And so our objective for today's presentation is to inform educators about the benefits of incorporating adaptive learning technology into their practice into a variety of different uh, disciplines and industries. And so we'll be following um, the agenda that you can see on your screen here. So we'll start um, by sharing the educational context for how we came up with the project and what the goals and gaps virtual simulations or the content and the scenarios could help solve. So we do, do look at three main perspectives. We looked at um, the learners, our educators, and our administrators. And so we will go into each of these in a little bit more detail as we move on through the presentation. Um, but the project did come up um, with the onset of COVID. So it was a really good timing for us because we had um, fewer programs that were in person, many programs that were virtual. And so we did need to find ways to um, uh, bridge those gaps for where we did have in-person simulations or cases or um, different scenarios to promote critical thinking. Um, so we needed to find a way to bridge that gap for learners in a virtual environment. Um, at the same time, we needed our educators or the ones coming to us, recognizing these gaps, letting us know, um, you know, that there was going to be struggles upcoming for our students and they wanted to find ways to, uh, as proactively as possible, uh, try to mitigate those gaps that they were seeing. And some programs, it, will, it really was more to, not more, but it was as well to meet accreditation standards. Um, so we needed to make sure that we were still hitting the marks on those areas as well. And then from my perspective as an administrator, manager, leader, um, my goal was to advance simulation beyond what we typically saw in nursing and in our PSW programs. So this was an opportunity for us to expand this to our community services and justice cluster programs. Um, also, I was looking for something that was going to be sustainable and budget friendly, so not just something I could do with the eCampus grant, but something that Mohawk would be able to be able to sustain after the grant was over. Um, and also, simulations are experiential learning, and they're tied to the st Strategic Mandate Agreement 3, and so we were able to hit that mark and hit that metric in more program areas than we had pre-COVID. And I'll pass it off now to my next team member, uh, Tim, to continue. Thank you, Theresa. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to dive into a little bit about the process that we went through. And so within the School of Health and Community Services at Mohawk College, we did have nine programs participate with us um, in, in this grant. And in total, we had about 16 educators who were tasked to create a virtual simulation that best fits the needs or the gaps that they found in their course and program. And so we were wondering, you know, you may be wondering why Affinity Learning. And so our team has had previous experience with other branching or simulation uh, platforms before. And so we just realized that there were a few features we were really looking for that Affinity Learning satisfied. The first one here being LMS integration and response tracking. And what this means is that it really allowed us and also the educators to follow the progress of the learner throughout the simulation, really understanding where they're having learning gaps, where there are areas of concern, 
and really use that to really drive or um, cater the debriefing session or lessons in the future to really address those gaps. The second point is versatility. So as um, creators and looking into the simulations, we were hoping to cater the screen to really fit exactly what we want the learner to see to avoid distraction or any other areas of concern. And of course, we also wanted a variety of different activity options um, to improve engagement and um, also to address other learning gaps um, or activity needs that programs would, wa would have wanted in their simulation. The third point is that we wanted a platform that was simple and intuitive. And so our biggest thing is to not have technology derail learning in our, in our learners. And so we found that Affinity Learning was really clean. It was really user-friendly. It was just really easy to understand. And so we were hopeful that this platform would make it easy for them to just really intake the knowledge and the, the information we were presenting them instead of being worried about the technology um, or any other technical concerns that may show up. And the last point here is that Affinity Learning was very fast and attentive in their um, support. And so they were very great in terms of we would reach out for um, areas of concern or errors that might have popped up um, and they just respond in a moment's notice, even if it was just questions about the platform or other features that we are interested in, they're very great in just responding really quickly and helping us learn more about um, what, what is possible. Um, and now I'll just pass it off um, to Sean, the co-founder of Affinity Learning, to just give a bit of a demo in terms of um, kind of what the platform can do. Perfect, thanks, Tim. Um, so I want to give a quick overview um, of the uh, authoring experience so those creating simulations as well as um, those who are um, using them, uh, the, the learners. And so um, this is kind of a bird's eye view of a scenario, uh, one of the scenarios built by the Mohawk team. And so you can see that the learner progresses through a series of screens here uh, until they reach a decision point, at which point they can take different pathways depending on their um, previous decisions on that screen. Um, so if I click on one of these screens and I preview it as a learner, um, you can see we have some text on the left. We have some, uh, we have an audio clip and then we have some interactive buttons here. Um, so these screens are totally flexible. These can be um, built out um, to the author's liking depending on learning objectives, uh, which I can show a bit more. But um, so as the learner here, I would um, click on these uh, buttons representing uh, Mr. Martin, who's the client um, and, and view his files. Um, and viewing this screen, um, I just want to bring this view up. So this is like the full catalog of building blocks that the author has at their disposal to um, build out the screen uh, the way they wish. And so some of these are media types, so videos and audio files, um, including 360. Uh, and a lot of these are interactions, so different activities and um, uh, uh, different interactivities and, and question types that you can embed into these screens. Um, so moving along to the decision point here, if we preview this video screen, um, just to give you a flavor of the, of the simulation. So we get a quick video, the PSW arrives uh, at the patient's home and is greeted by the uh, caregiver. Um, that brings us to a decision point, how we would like to introduce ourselves. We have three options here. So I'm gonna pick one that I know is the incorrect uh, choice here. I'm gonna say, hey, what's up? So I then get the video uh, associated uh, with that choice. And after this plays out, I get some feedback associated with why that was the wrong decision here. And when I press continue, I get another chance at um, uh, introducing myself the correct way. And so this is sort of the flow that this, um, this particular simulation uh, follows as it goes through, as you can see, um, <clears throat> until the learner finally reaches the end. And at that point, um, as Tim mentioned, all of, the, uh, all of the learner's choices are represented here on the right, which they can download as, as a PDF and is also Think back to the uh, learning management system uh, optionally. Um, so that's sort of one flavor of, of STEM uh, that you can build. Um, to provide another example from Mohawk, um, we have support for 360 media like this. Um, this is a police foundations learning context. So exploration of a, a crime scene. Um, as the student clicks on the placards, they can they make notes about it and then continue. So just to provide kind of a, a different um, style of, of uh, learning activity that, that Affinity supports. Um, and then maybe finally, I'll just quickly show, uh, we also have a natural language-based uh, interaction here. So <clears throat> you can see we have uh, two and a half minutes here to uh, interview this patient and gather some uh, key information. So here I'm using my own words. I'm gonna ask him how old he is. 
And when I get that piece right, it's illuminated on the right hand side as a key piece of information. And this is also very configurable. So you can you can build these personas um, however you uh, however you wish, depending on the, the situation that you're simulating. Um, and the very last thing that I'll mention is that all of these activities are very easily embeddable in an LMS uh, system. So, um, for example, um, to embed this in, in, in Canvas or in D2L or another learning management system, you would just copy this link. Uh, and then that would enable you to sync grades back to your, uh, your, your learning management system. Uh, and, and most importantly, provides a single sign-on experience. So you don't have to uh, manage a separate set of accounts for learners accessing these activities. It's just a one-click access. And then all the uh, grades and, and uh, results are gonna be tied to that learner. So I think I'll, I've probably exceeded my time there. So I think I'll stop it. and hand it back over to the Mohawk team. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. That was very informative. Um, awesome. And so once we were kind of finished going through that process, we've built the simulations and we started putting them into courses. We decided to send a survey out to the 16 educators just to get their feedback on how it went and kind of their thoughts um, in terms of also like what the students' uh, feedback was and also their experience going through it. Um, once we received all that feedback, our team kind of grouped them into seven points, and we'll discuss them a bit here. The first one was that it was an effective and low-risk way to introduce crisis management. And so this was really shown because a few of our educators decided that their simulation would be used to demonstrate a scenario that isn't that common in, um, in the profession, or it's just something that doesn't happen as often. So these situations could include um, experiencing care in a palliative setting, uh, an angry family member or client or patient, a code red or even a code blue at a hospital. And so having these simulations has allowed the students to just get a little bit of a sense of what it might be like in the real life set situation, get a bit more comfortable with what to do, how to do these things and what to expect. Um, and they just felt more comfortable in preparation for either clinical experiences or even when they graduate and start working um, in, in their profession. The second point was a reflection and engagement that was shown by the students, which uh, educators really described through the debrief sessions. And so they noticed that these students were really just asking a lot more um, like reflection questions, a lot more critical thinking questions, and really engaged in the discussion that was happening in the debrief sessions, not only with the educator, but also with um, fellow students. And so this was just really helpful to get their insight into what exactly they thought um, how they did in the simulation, areas that they think still need more clarification. Um, and yeah, it just really improved just engagement in general. The third point, as Sean was saying, was that LMS integration really helped with marking in general. Uh, instead of having the students copy or download something and upload it into an LMS, the report got sent straight to our LMS and straight to our gradebook. And so the educators had a really easy time just following up with exactly what the students clicked, where they're struggling with, and um, it's helped save time in that sense. The fourth point uh, was also that there was a significant reduction in time and cost. And so normally in a in-person simulation, you would need to hire a simulation technologist to be there. You need the professor to be there. You may need to schedule time with the students to figure out what's best. You might need to prep and clean up afterwards. And with virtual simulations, all of this wasn't really necessarily needed. Uh, we just needed to put in the time to build these activities. And then afterwards, uh, you didn't have to worry too much about having other people there to support you, to clean up, and also to make sure that it was available for the students at their best time. The fifth point was that the, it provided more insight into new learning gaps that students were having. And so these simulations were used to address current learning gaps. But again, through the debriefing sessions, they, educators really realize that students may struggle in certain elements, they may need more clarification in other knowledge um, areas. And so using those, um, using that information in these, in these new learning gaps, they were able to cater uh, their debriefing sessions or future sessions to really help address these uh, knowledge gaps. And also to consider potentially whether or not they need to provide more information before these simulations were done to help them feel more successful when going through them. The sixth point is that it really helped provide structure when learning a new skill. Sean uh, was showing a little bit about what we did, but we used a structure called pseudo branching in our simulations that allowed students to kind of have that 
the ability to explore, choose different areas, uh, different options, and but in order to go forward, they have to get the correct response. And so that was really helpful for us because when we were teaching a new skill in the simulation, we were able to provide key information, key feedback slides or content slides right after each point to really help guide them through that new skill process and making sure that they learn in a chronological order um, and instead of confusing them with kind of jumping back and forth. And the last point uh, that we found from the educators was that the development does take a lot of time and support and they were very grateful and just having uh, this dedicated time and team to really help them build out these simulations, take their ideas and really make it into an asset that they could use and was helpful for the students. Um, and now I'll pass it off to um, Rachel to talk more about the learner feedback. Thank you. Um, so we also had the opportunity to survey our learners. Um, we created a Microsoft form that we gave to professors and asked them to put in their course shells after the page with the simulation. So we had about a thousand students have access to this form. And of those students, we had 370 responses. And there were different sections to this form, so we wanted to share some feedback from our Likert section. We had 95 to 98% agree on a couple of these points that we wanted to share. Um, so the first is that the simulation allowed them to practice and apply professional competencies from their program, and also that the simulation improved their learning experience, both at about 98% of our learners. Um, and then about 96% of learners agreed that they'd like more of these simulations in their program and that affinity learning as a platform was really easy to navigate. So this was really great feedback from our learners. Um, overall, very positive in the Likert section. Um, we were just really happy to see that they were appreciating these um, and really learning from them. We also had an open-ended section in our learner feedback, and we've grouped these into kind of eight themes that we wanted to share. So the first is that students appreciated practicing skills in a realistic environment with no risk. So our educators worked really hard to make sure that all of the options that the students could choose, the correct options and the distractors, were realistic things that students might actually choose in the field. Um, so it did feel very realistic, but it was also very low risk. So if a student chose an incorrect answer, there wasn't a client that was actually going to be affected. And the students felt a lot less stressed because the risk was reduced and it helped facilitate their learning. Uh, so one student said that it didn't seem like an assignment, but more of an application to the real world, which felt like we were really hitting the mark of what we were going for when we read this. Secondly, we had this kind of errorless or trial and error learning with feedback. And um, so Tim talked about this pseudo branching style of simulation that we use. So when a student got a response wrong, they got to see what might happen, learn why it was wrong, and then go back to the question and try again. But also every student had to get the correct answer to move forward. So at the end, everybody did make it through the simulation and was able to see the correct answers but it kind of took them through these trial and error loops to get to the end. So we had one student say that they actually especially liked when they could pick the wrong answer, that it showed them what would happen. It gave them feedback and let them know why it was wrong. And this was key feedback that we received over and over and over again from our students. Third, the students liked being able to bring a simulation to termination. So in class, they would learn a lot of separate skills, but then in the simulation, they got to work from calling a client from the waiting room to dismissing them from the exam room or from an incident happening at their organization all the way through resolving it with all of the stakeholders. And that's something that's just really hard to do in traditional didactic classes. So they appreciated being able to put all the pieces together in the simulation. Fourth, they appreciated being able to focus on one skill or decision at a time. So because this is still a learning experience, we're able to focus the students in and say, what's your next priority action? And then have them solve that and then choose another priority. Take things down into manageable pieces while they were learning, but also practicing the skills. Fifth, uh, we heard from a lot of students that it was very confidence building before an assessment to try this out online 
get feedback, see how they were doing. And then when they actually had to perform the skill in front of an evaluator, they felt like they were more prepared um, and just ready to do it, more confident, which helped them to actually do well on their assessments. Sixth, they appreciated that it was self-paced and that there were downloadable reports that they took kind of as a proof of progress, that they had worked through it, they had finished it. Um, so the student said it allowed them to work at their own pace and have collaboration with a peer, which was a really great thing that we found about these virtual simulations is that they could work at their own pace. They could work with peers. We don't typically grade our simulations. We might give a completion mark if they get all the way through, or we would uh, grade the quality of a debrief, but we wouldn't typically grade the simulation itself, which gives them opportunities to work at their own pace or work with peers which helps facilitate their learning. Seventh, we were able to cater to multiple learning styles at once. So our visual learners had photos and videos and text. Our auditory learners also had those videos and um, audio buttons for long text screens. And our kinesthetic learners had these videos that were filmed as if the camera was the eyes of the professional. So it felt very immersive and engaging. And we also had uh, some faculty members who had um, documentation sheets that would need to be used in the field that they would put in for learners to fill out while they were completing the simulation, which also helped uh, our kinesthetic learners. And finally, the learners appreciated that the variety of things that were in the simulations was engaging. So we had virtual tours, we had AI chats, we had drag and drop activities. It wasn't the same thing every time. And they also just love that Affinity was really clean and clear and easy to navigate because I'm sure as most of us know, technology can get really confusing. So they liked the fact that it was just very clean and clear and they were able to understand where they were going. Uh, so the students said that they felt like a detective trying to figure out all the aspects, which really hit home for us that this idea of gamification of learning had really been achieved in the simulations that we were doing and the students were engaging. Um, and having fun as well as learning. The other thing that I want to share with you are some outcomes that we found. Uh, we recently touched base with three of the professors who we worked with, and we asked them if they saw any differences between their cohorts of students who didn't have virtual simulations and now their cohorts of students who are using them. So of these three individuals that we spoke with, one previously used um, in-person simulations, and now the entire course has been transitioned virtual, and the other two had never used simulations, and now we're using our virtual simulations. So um, our one professor who had used in-person simulations says that there's been an attitude shift in the students from this, I have to do simulations, simulations are um, nerve-wracking, and I'm relieved that they're over, to this idea of they want to do the simulations. They actually want the profs to open them up faster so they can see what's happening with the clients. And uh, this prof attributed this to the students having less stress. Um, they're not as stressed out about making right and wrong decisions because it's actually encouraged to check things out. And so they're actually engaging with the client better. The second thing we heard from all the profs is that there's more robust reflection and clinical reasoning happening with all of the students, um, which we've heard multiple times through the presentation. The third thing that they mentioned was that the first person style of filming that we used for our film scenarios really let the learners feel like they were in the shoes of that professional and it helps them to own the decisions that they're making and really feel like they're there even though they aren't. Um, and the profs identified this as a really important and engaging part of the simulation. Our first point was that collaborative discussion was happening about the options that were available. Um, so one of our profs had the students do this in person in a face-to-face -face class. They were doing this uh, virtual simulation together in groups. And she said that there was a lot of back and forth conversation about the pros and cons of different options, which was really deepening that critical reason critical thinking and clinical reasoning uh, that she was looking for. Fifth, while we didn't necessarily notice any significant changes in grades between the different cohorts, uh, one prof did note that her course ratings have actually increased slightly. 
Um, so it just goes to show how the students are really valuing these simulations that is being shown even in the evaluations. And then finally, um, again, from our prof who had previously done in-person simulations, she noted that students are now choosing incorrect answers as they're encouraged to do in this virtual simulation, even though these are things that they never would have chosen before in in-person simulations. And they're able to see how even making small changes in tone or in wording can make a big difference in your interaction with a client. And now I'm going to turn it back to Tim to finish this off. Thank you. And so there are definitely challenges within this process that we came across um, being shown here on the screen. There, we did start in the middle of May and we did have about approximately seven weeks with uh, our faculty members uh, to just to you know, brainstorm the ideas, come up with the storyboarding um, and the scenario, and then also to build it out and film and everything. The second challenge we had was that we did have a decent amount of first time faculty, meaning that they haven't really explored or knew much about branching or virtual simulations before. And so figuring out how to guide them through this new process. Uh, the third point here is a technology learning curve. So of course, whenever we use new technology, it is a little bit daunting, not knowing exactly how it's gonna be used, how it's gonna look like and change the workflow for uh, learners and also educators. And so guiding them through this whole process as well. And of course, variety and functionality. And so with the nine programs and 16 subject matter experts, it was sometimes difficult to figure out exactly um, what's the best build or activity for their learning gaps or purposes. And so figuring out um, with Sean exactly what's the best features, how can we create something that would best replicate what they were looking for. And so with all this in mind, one of the biggest strategies we had to counteracting all these challenges was really the team that we have brought and built and dedicated to this project. So in addition to all the 16 educators that we had, we had nine team members in total that were able to support this project and the faculty and educators throughout the whole thing, all coming from different backgrounds and expertise in different, um, in different areas. So one of them being our project leader who really focused on the administrative concerns, budgeting, making sure we're on our, um, we're following the timeline and just uh, dealing with um, kind of all the miscellaneous things that come up here and there. We had Sean, the affinity learning, um, founder who really helped us get a better understanding of the platform, helped figure out other new features or um, information that we might be missing when creating these activities. We had two simulation leads who were faculty that has had experience previously with virtual simulations. So they were able to really just sit down with each professor to guide them through this process, understand how it fits in their course, learning objectives, and just building out the storyboard. We had a simulation design technologist that really focused on the pedagogy of SIM, bringing in his thoughts about when branching should be used, when which activities should be used, um, and just making sure that we kind of followed the gold standard of virtual simulations. And we had three digital learning technicians, which were support staff specific for the School of Health and Community Services uh, that really helped provide um, insight into the platform, they really understood the technology and its potential uses and helped film um, the videos, helped edit them as well, and just create uh, the different activities in Affinity Learning. And so with these nine individuals, we were really able to counteract all these challenges by separating the work and kind of spending more time one-on-one -on -one with each faculty member, um, building a relationship with them, really understanding their vision in its entirety, um, and we thought that that was a big part in just making sure that this grant uh, went smoothly and all these projects that were able to be implemented in time. And now I just wanted to take some time to talk about the future potential of simulations and virtual simulations um, as well. Um, the first point being that that really helped learners understand more about the profession. Um, really from the learners feedback, they started to understand the significance and the impact that the profession has by going through these virtual simulations, understanding how it could impact a client, a patient, um, and also to really help them figure out exactly if this profession is for them. Some of them for sure really realized that like, yes, this is what I wanna do, but also some um, students indicated that maybe this was something that they need to look more into or figure out exactly if this was um, the best fit based on the situations that they be placed in. 
The second point is that assessments could become more application-based. So instead of more siloed multiple choice questions that um, aim for critical thinking, we're able to place students into a scenario-based kind of context that allows them to go through a situation and apply their critical thinking in specific key um, points in the scenario and to determine uh, their ability to apply their knowledge in those settings. The third point is the continued improved realism and experience in our simulations. And so to this day, our team continues to work with Sean and Affinity Learning to figure out how we can make these simulations more realistic and engaging for our students. This can include audio analytics, which is figuring out the tone and intonation, and if it is appropriate for those particular moments in time, improved AI chat or natural language to really replicate a conversation you might have with an individual, and of course, AR and VR using 360 technology to implement 360 photos and 360 videos in simulation to really put them in, in the foot of um, the profession. The fourth point is the use um, potential of simulations to supplement and increase clinical hours. And so, of course, there's a continued research on this, and there's definitely research that really focuses on um, the learner outcomes and the impact it has using simulations versus clinical placement. Um, and there is um, a lot of research just showing that learners who do a simulation compared to uh, in-person clinical placement, that their learning outcomes are similar, if not greater in some areas. And so with virtual simulations, we definitely need more research to continue to learn how we can use them with in-person simulations, whether that's to supplement um, and to, or to replace clinical hours. Um, but definitely there is potential here to use it in a variety of settings. And of course, research continues to expand in this field to apply it not only to nursing students, but also to other professions such as occupational therapists, radio radiologists, and also even um, police foundations or social service um, services as well. Um, perfect. And so that's it for our presentation. We thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to um, our, our presentation and on the screen, we just have Affinity Learning's contact in case you needed to reach out to Affinity Learning or Sean, and I'll just open up the floor for any questions that you may have. So I see it. there has been some back and forth in the chat already. So uh, that's been uh, terrific. So thank you, Sean, for answering those questions from our first specific participant so far. And we invite anyone who has any questions to, if you'd like to put up your hand and open your mic and we'd be glad to uh, allow you to uh, to ask any questions. Um, I'm just wondering, and I, so obviously the videos and there's a lot of production that go, goes into those. How important from a sustainability point of view is kind of capturing when you create these assets and having them cataloged in a way that lets them be put into other contexts and shared across programs. How important is that to kind of the sustainability of this kind of project? And how do you kind of facilitate that sharing across disciplines and, and the sharing of content and material in different contexts? Thank you, that's a great question. And that was something that we definitely keep in mind. Um, throughout this project and actually so Tim and Rachel they're a part of our digital learning technicians we have three I'll let them actually speak to this piece but um, not just in virtual simulations but in everything that they're doing to support our faculty and staff everything is very organized and cataloged so we can easily share it but I'll let them talk about their specifics on how they're doing that creating that and, and collaborating yeah thank you um, I think that was something that we definitely talked about with our professors as we got going with the project um, was one of our first questions is trying to figure out, is this something that is really specific to you or is this something that we could potentially use in other areas? Um, so for example, we did a couple simulations with sonography where we were showing ultrasounds and that was really gonna stay within ultrasound. It wasn't gonna go farther. So we really contextualized it to ultrasound. Um, but when we were doing something like a code red or a code blue, uh, we would try to take out some qualifiers. So things like uh, 
we could write the script in such a way that we don't actually introduce what type of professional you are. We don't have to say that you're a radiologist going in to scan somebody's arm. We can just say, you walk into work one day and while you're greeting your coworkers, you see an electrical fire. Um, so just being aware of what identifiers and indicators were going into simulations, depending on whether it was something that could be generalizable to other contexts or not. Uh, was something that we really took into consideration in terms of could it be shared across disciplines. Mm -hmm. I'll also say in addition to that, what was really nice about being part of the development section as well in this project was that we knew exactly what type of assets were being built for each uh, activity or simulation. And so that allowed us to even isolate different parts of it and share that with others, right? So if they notice that one particular video or one activity um, really related to what another faculty wanted to do, um, it'd be easy for us to kind of replicate that or even share that resource with them to help them kind of take bits and pieces or even ideas from different simulations and put it into their own and make it their own. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that great answer. Um, I'm not seeing any questions popping up yet in the chat, but again, feel free to put them in there. Oh, we do have a hand raised, and if I can uh, identify. So whoever, i sorry, I'm not seeing who has the, oh, yes. Monica, I see there you are. <laughs> I, I don't see all the faces at once. So Monica, yeah, go ahead and ask your I, question. Yeah, I think firstly, I think it's such a great presentation. I must say, I kept writing questions and as the presentation progressed, most of my questions got answered and I kept crossing them. Oh, they've answered this. And also, thank you for such a great presentation. I had one question though, and I wanted to talk about the educator's experience. That is basically the faculty. I did like that there was a lot of support for them in terms of the people who knew about the simulation and uh, you know the digital support. Having said that, I still wanted to understand that, you know, for a faculty that already has some work to do, this is some extra work, you know, this is some time that they need to take out from their regular work to say, okay, I'm ready to create a simulation. So I, like, how much time did it take? And like, how were you able to handle that uh, faculty, which already has some work and what challenges did they face? And what motivated them to create and say, okay, well, you know, I'm going to take out some time and uh, you know, create a simulation and put in those extras. So I just wanted to understand that aspect of the educator's feedback. Sure, so I can start with this piece. Thanks so much, Monica, for that question. Um, so into the project itself, we did build in time for faculty to have a partial release on their workload or their courses or their complementary functions. Um, mm -hmm. So in the college sector, we have uh, SWIFTs, those standard workload agreements. Um, and um, so we did build in time into the project framework to have um, some of that release time. When mm -hmm. we initially launched the project, the development for the scenarios was set to happen over the four months of uh, spring and summer. And so mm -hmm. our faculty are usually on two months, off two months. So they had basically seven to eight weeks um, to create their scenario and to work through with the digital uh, technologists, the simulation design um, specialists, and our um, faculty simulationists. So they mm -hmm. did have that two month period to work through the curriculum, build the curriculum development. Mm -hmm. Then our um, digital learning technicians and our simulation design technologists actually built what they were looking to have created in Affinity. Then mm -hmm. when the faculty returned in the fall semester, we presented to them what we built based on the scenarios and scripts that they had already created. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we made some slight adjustments, some slight changes, we received their feedback, and then they were either launched in the second half of the fall or in the winter or in the spring, just depending on where, where the course fell into the curriculum. Um, so we did have, uh, we did work with um, faculty that volunteered. So the programs that came forward that were part of this, it wasn't mm -hmm. me saying, I really like human <laughs> services and social service worker. I went out to all 40 programs within our school okay. and I said, here's a project. I'm about to submit it. Who's interested? Who wants to come right. forward? So it was on a volunteer basis originally. Since mm -hmm. then, we have onboarded uh, more program areas and the mm -hmm. associate deans um, or chairs, uh, depending on the area, um, mm -hmm. they are still providing um, some release time for the simulation. So we did collect feedback 
from mm -hmm. the educators or the associate deans that if they had faculty that participated, was the time enough, was the support yeah. enough? And we took that feedback um, to make it sustainable moving forward. So sometimes our faculty are receiving um, a complimentary time for some development. Sometimes they're just excited and they just want to <laughs> do them. You know, if you're a yes. faculty member, you know, yeah. people just get excited and, and yeah. time or not, they're going to do them. So we just make sure we support them. And our goal is to meet faculty where they are at. So if they are great with technology, understand simulation, wow. know what, how to pre-brief, know how to debrief, we let them take the bulk of that and do what they want with it. But if they're starting from scratch, they haven't had familiarity with this, then we mm -hmm. take them right through, right from inception all the way to completion. And we just provide the level of support that they need. Thank you so much because you know what I understand and what I really like and probably that's the reason it's effective is like through the uh, whatever you told me that it was a part of a strategy like you built it into it right it wasn't like who wants to once they volunteered there was a process there was time allotted and I think that is one of the things that whenever a new technology is introduced uh, you know taking care of that is what kind of works in favor so thank you so much for that response really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks for the great answer. Uh, Edmund, I see you have your hand up there. Why don't you go ahead and open your mic? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it, it was a pleasure to, to, to listen to this great presentation. And thank you for entertaining some of my questions. The platform is impressive. I can see lots of potential in it. Uh, I so much so that I was wondering and was thinking why it hasn't been developed earlier on. So that's the right time to have it. But uh, come back to my question, uh, uh, thinking of accredited uh, programs that needs to be regulated, and perhaps this is a question for Teresa, or I don't know anyone on the team, uh, have you uh, kind of uh, any feedback from uh, professional associations, if this is the case, actually, if this is applicable to one of your programs, because I saw a bunch of uh, multiple programs that you have. And this joins my other question that I put on the chat, and it's the vision uh, that could we think one day that, because right now I see the context and the positioning of this platform is to prepare the students, the learners to uh, get the tests and uh, the, the, pass the exams. Could we think one day that this could sit instead of the exam itself uh, and would that be acceptable from a professional association accreditation point of view, or is this just a dream? Thank you. Okay. Maybe I'll start in this question, then maybe Rachel has something to respond with because she also unmuted as well. Um, so I would say, so we've only been doing these virtual simulations for a couple of years. And in these programs, we haven't been through accreditation processes with them. But um, during COVID, I know that uh, a lot of professional um, des uh, designations and, and professional bodies did, you know, relax some of their standards. So I would say, I can't really give an answer. It is, it is each individual professions and accreditation body. It's, it's really up to them. But our job is to try to make the case through our program reviews and through our, our accreditation processes to have some of these um, virtual simulations as an acceptable uh, means or modality to you know, achieve some of those standards and achieve some of those clinical hours. But we haven't personally gone through any um, accreditation since we started with these virtual simulations to speak to that individually. Um, and then for the second question where you said, would they be best positioned for proper exams or could we one day think of them being the exam test itself? I think you're exactly it. It could be either and we've actually used it for both. Um, Rachel, I don't know if this is what maybe you were going to speak on. I'll pass it right over to you then. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely was not going to speak on accreditation, but I can speak from the assessment point of view. Um, I, while I was on the development team, I also was teaching in January and I did use affinity as one of my assessments. Um, so we typically in my program, we would do a triple jump exam. And the first step of this exam is that the student has to interview a client. And typically what we would have is multiple faculty members getting extra hours that week to sit with students for eight hours a day for two days to um, have the students ask them questions. And then 
you would look at the sheet and figure out, okay, is there an answer to that question? If yes, give them the answer. If no, they'd ask a new one. Um, and it was just a lot of time and resources that was going into that. So for my program, we worked with Sean to create an artificial intelligence chat bot that could do a similar job. And we could have all of the students come on at the same time and work with the chat bot independently um, to do that first part of the exam. Um, so for us, it actually really alleviated a lot of strain that was happening in the program to try and get this uh, assessment to run. And we were able to replace that first part of the assessment with this uh, artificial intelligence chatbot in a simulation that would help to guide them through that question asking process. Um, so I think we are sort of starting to see it come in. Um, right now, a lot of groups do use it kind of as that preparation, and then we'll get uh, an in-person simulation at the end of term that they're being evaluated on. But we also have groups that um, all of their simulations, I think one of our PSW courses, they have six virtual simulations, and that's, that's a big part of their course. So it's getting there, but maybe not quite there yet. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, there are lots of other questions, but uh, because of the time and as Sean uh, offered kindly to, to do a follow up, I will follow up offline. Thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for that question, Edmund. And I think I think it really exemplifies, certainly from eCampus's perspective, why we're so interested in adaptive learning um, and these types of technologies. They really are part of a transformative uh, technology in the sector. And I think that as it it advances more and more professional associations and institutions will grow, you know, take full advantage of the potential I think that's there so I think that was a great discussion um, so that uh, concludes today's webinar and I'd like to uh, thank our presenters for sharing their work and their insights here today thank you to you our audience I hope that uh, you found some useful information on how you can incorporate adaptive learning into your programs and courses and last but certainly not least thank you to our eCampus Ontario communications team for making today's webinar possible and handling all of the behind the scenes arrangements. We certainly couldn't do it without you. Uh, if you would like to find out more about our work in adaptive learning or to connect on work you might be doing in adaptive learning, please visit our adaptive learning webpage. Uh, today's webinar is the third in a series offered in October and November. The recordings from our first two webinars can be found on our YouTube channel and adaptive learning webpage. Uh, watch your email and your e and our eCampus Ontario social media channels for details on additional webinars that will be offered starting in January. Uh, I encourage everyone to explore the eCampus Ontario website for our various programs and services, including Ontario Extend, Micro Credentials, CAPFO, the Open Library, Ontario Exchange, and more. A couple of important opportunities include the OER Adoption Initiative through the Open Library. As of 2022, Ontario's post-secondary sector created over 600 educational resources that have been added to the Open Library and is now time to adopt these amazing assets. Assets. This project focuses on fostering discovery, use, impact, and sustainable engagement on the Open Library's VLS collection. Interested colleagues uh, should visit the OER integration webpage at the link now being posted in the chat. Uh, as an additional bonus, eligible adopters may be entitled to a $300 stipend for unique OER. And be sure to mark your calendar for eCampus Ontario's test conference, The Hybrid Experience, on November 15th and 16th at Toronto's Globe and Mail Centre. Join us at this premier event where we celebrate education and community. Tickets are limited and can be obtained at the link now being posted in the chat until this Friday. However, if you're unable to attend in person, no worries, we have a free webinar series coming up next week with registration available at the link now being posted in the chat. More details on these services and access to the recording from today's presentation uh, will be sent out by email to all registrants. So I thank you for attending here today and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.